I think we're ready. Right. Oh. You ready? All right, let's stand to our feet this morning. Let's worship together. Let's get ourselves ready for this evening this morning. Let's we'll sing a couple of songs that hopefully you know. We'll sing along with that.
God's people sin. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Appreciate that so much, but it's beautiful. I want to remind you of a few things coming up, if you will. A couple of important announcements. Let's begin. Uh, Miss Robin, do you want to start us out? Yes. Yeah. I actually have two. Um, one, I need to apologize to Mr. Allen. I don't because he spoke to me a couple of weeks ago about a friend that has a, she is gathering coats uh, to donate uh, to kids, and so the deadline for gathering those is next week. And uh, yeah, so if anyone has gently used a new coat that they would like to donate to this ministry, please bring them by next week, and we will get them to them. Um, the second one is our uh, Operation Christmas box. We have boxes in the ladies' classroom. Uh, if you want to fill the boxes yourselves, there are different age groups and boys and girls. I have lists of suggested items and items that are not allowed. Um, and there's a, I set up a box back there on the table as kind of an example of some of the things uh, that you can put in them. Uh, if anyone is interested in filling one themselves, let me know. We'll get to the boxes and the list. If you would like to help, but not actually be, have to do the shopping and everything to fill the boxes, you can donate in the offering that's designated. Um, designate on the envelope or the check or whatever, uh, what it's for. Because we are, the girls from the youth class are going on a shopping trip here in <laughs> And they are going to shop for these boxes. And so if you would like to donate money for that. There's also shipping costs if you would like to donate to help with that. Uh, the ladies group is also going to do some things to help cover the cost. Awesome. So, with me or Shimona if you have a question. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Robin. Appreciate that very much. What if you didn't say to guys? I'm taking them on a shopping trip, right? <laughs> 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 just saying, I'm just saying, pity on us. Today in all seriousness, uh, we want to take time to remember the events of 9-11, and uh, we'll explain why in a bit. Um, tonight, having a business meeting at 6 p.m., so be aware of that. Uh, of course, this is the end of the week there from the 5th to the 12th of the Edmund Millen offering, state offering, that goes to help children's homes different things, various things like that in Oklahoma that the Southern Baptist Convention take care of and help provide for. So be aware of those things coming up. And uh, the offering, you can write it on the regular offering envelope. And I think we may have a few in the back. We may not remember, but if you want to give to that and we uh, pray about that and uh, see, see what the Lord will have you to do. Uh, the 18th Senior Saints Fellowship, 1030 a.m. Uh, I didn't see if Miss Leona is here uh, for any announcements. I didn't see her. Uh, but uh, they are going to be meeting here and leaving from here at 1030, right? Uh, and going where? Where is it again? Locust Grove. Locust Grove. Right. Okay. So, country Cottage. Okay. So anyways, uh, we're in some pretty good places. Very good food. I'm telling you. Wow. Uh, so anyway, Senior Saints, uh, come out for that. The 19th prayer service, that's next Sunday night at 6 p.m. Uh, we dedicate a time, started doing this last year, uh, just a time of just playing right over need, the needs of the church body, the needs of our country, uh, and we certainly do need that today. Uh, so that's the 19th, the 25th, team trip to Arcadia. Uh, I have a question on that, uh, Pastor Randy. Uh, that is kind of a retro arcade, right? So here's my question. Does that mean that it goes back in time as far as how much you spend on that arcade versus $1.50? It goes back to 25 cents, is that correct or incorrect? It's $5 to get in. Oh, okay. Well, hey, amen. Who cares? Do what? It smells like an old old thing. Does it? Man, I'm going to have to make that. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, uh, be aware of that, kids. Uh, October 1st deadline for Christmas box money. Uh, And on the 10th, I want to encourage you to be here for that. Uh, Man of Sunday with Jerry Abbott. Jerry Abbott is a dear friend of mine. He and his sweet wife and uh, many of us in our church. Uh, godly people and have been involved in, in manna feeding center, setting those up for quite some time. Uh, his area particularly is over the area of Europe, uh, European area, I believe, right? And uh, Rome, uh, Romania, excuse me, uh, in certain areas like that. Anyways, they set up orphanages and feeding centers that are connected uh, with uh, missionaries uh, as a way to be able to minister to kids. Awesome, awesome thing that they do. So please be here for that, okay? At this time, I believe we have a video uh, that we're going to show. 
most of us remember that day. It's etched in our minds, a permanent reminder of tragedy. We all watched helplessly as lives were lost, heroes were born, and a nation was forever changed. The loss was unimaginable, the sorrow unbearable. But through that pain, we witnessed the resolve of a nation. We saw chaos give birth to courage, fear transform into fortitude, and destruction give way to determination. In the midst of the brokenness, freedom stood immovable. Today, we remember those we lost. We honor the heroes who saved so many and grieve the families who have suffered so much. It's been 20 years, but we still remember and we will never forget. Amen. I tell you, I was uh, privileged to have an opportunity to take part in a uh, uh, prayer, basically a prayer service yesterday for our community in Silent Springs, and thanks to Lisa Rizzo asking, and appreciated that, and many of you were able to be there, and that, that was such a blessing, thank you. Um, and uh, I was reminded, of talking to a, uh, a fellow pastor, uh, watching the memorial services and things take place yesterday morning, uh, in the time when the, the uh, planes hit, the different times, the three planes hit, um, actually four. Um, for those folks, as they were reading off the names, you know, just to look at them, as they would say these names, it was as real as if it had happened yesterday. Uh, it, you know, it's been 20 years, and it doesn't seem like that's even possible. And for those that lived through that uh, time, there's many in here today, I know, that, that this morning, that, that just know it as a, a piece of history in our country, just like I do Pearl Harbor, uh, and many of us do Pearl Harbor. Uh, but I remember exactly where I was. You remember exactly where you were. Uh, when you learn about the planes in those towers. And uh, it was just a very sobering uh, feeling. Our, our desire today is not to um, spread uh, discouragement or, or to lead here today with a uh, with uh, feeling downtrodden. No, no. Uh, our desire today is to learn from 9-11, uh, uh, to take some lessons from that that we can apply, that we can use and better impact our country for the cause of Christ. Amen? And so I want to ask you, if you would, turn your Bibles to Psalm 90 this morning, verse 9 through 10. And at the end of this message, we're going to have a special type of invitation. I'm going to ask Colin and a couple of people who will pray specifically um, for various things uh, regarding what we're going to talk about. Uh, praying for the families who are still hurting. It's, again, just like it happened yesterday. All this stuff has come up again. And, uh, kids who have grown up without parents uh, or husbands and wives. Uh, all of that that took place on that day. But let's look at two passages to open things up this morning. Psalm 90, 9 through 10. The Bible says, this is Moses speaking, For all of our days are passed away. In thy wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For soon it is soon cut off and we fly away. What Moses is saying is that uh, we, we, we do live life, and life is difficult, right? And he said we all have this average lifespan that we live, basically, when you, when you get right down to it. And he said, knowing that, knowing that tomorrow is promised to no one, and we'll see that here in a bit as well, um, he said, God, help me to apply my heart into this, and help me to live wisely in the world in which I uh, live within. Let's jump over, if we could, to First Chronicles. 1232, 1 Chronicles 1232. Another important passage, and I'll explain. I believe these two uh, kind of coincide. They go together, they run congruently. The Bible says in verse 32, 1 Chronicles 1232, it says, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all of their brethren were at their commandment. Let's focus in on that first half of that passage. He says, in the children of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, there were men that had a, a, just an understanding of the times in which they lived, so that they might know what 
Israel ought to do, what, what the nation of Israel ought to do. And I look at these two passages we just read, one by Moses, uh, this other speaking of the tribe of Issachar, uh, and I, I put those things together, and what I come away with is that we are not to hide our head in the sand as Christians and pretend like we're not living in the days that we're living in, right? We, we are facing things such as COVID and a whole slew of other messes uh, that this uh, world is dealing with right now, tragedies, uh, looking at uh, what has happened in Afghanistan, looking at thinking back 20 years ago to what happened here on our own nation's soil. Uh, and my friends, I, I would think it would be a, an egregious error on our part if we did not apply our hearts unto wisdom to learn from the times in which we live so that we might better be able to grow God's kingdom, to share the gospel message with those who maybe at no other time in history are willing to listen, but they are now. Because they're seeing the same things that we're seeing. Okay? And they're wondering, why are these things happening? And who do we look to for trust and security? Where do we run when we need to find that, those things, right? And so it's for that reason. I want, it, I want today to be more than just revisiting a pivotal day in our nation's history. I really want it that affected all of us, by the way, even those that didn't live in it. You know now, you've been impacted by it. You realize that. We have made decisions... Everybody knows that September 10th was way different than September 11th. In fact, I think back to it, September 10th, the 11th was just another date on the calendar. It'll never be that again. You'll never open up a calendar book and see September 11th and think of it the same way that we would have before. September 10th, we did things a lot differently. You didn't have to go through PSA and get patted down and have all the x-rays done and all that. Families walked right up to the gate to, to see you off at the airport, right? Well, now that doesn't happen, right? That hasn't happened since then. And so you see how things have changed and changed drastically within our lifetime uh, in those issues. And so I just want to take that, if we can, uh, and, and move with it this morning to look back and, and, and to look at what 9-11 still reminds us of, because it does remind us of some important points. The first being this that I want to share with you this morning. 9-11 still reminds us of the harsh reality of evil in this world. It does. When you think back to it, you think about the events that were uh, perpetrated upon our country and upon people that had no clue what was getting ready to take place. Right? It reminds us that evil uh, does still run rampant in this world. John 3, 19. John chapter 3 and verse 19. God's holy word says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into this world. And praise God for the light. Amen. For the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, light is coming to this world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Right? Their deeds were evil. Shortly after 9-11 took place, this old and familiar question started getting brought up and churned up and brought up to the surface. Things that have been even echoed since then. Anytime there's a tragedy, anytime there's something horrific that takes place. Questions like this. Why would God have allowed that terrible event to take place? What would possess a person to do such a thing, to hijack an airplane and to fly it into a building? Why do bad things happen to those who are innocent? They're pretty big questions, aren't they? Well, I'm not sure that we'll ever adequately answer, answer all those questions. Scripture does tell us that we live in an evil world because it is a sin-cursed, fallen world. Why do evil things happen? It's because we live in a world where at one time, years and years and years ago, somebody listened to a serpent, right? And said, you know what? I think I am going to live life the way that I want to live it. Who cares what God said? I'm just going to take a chance that this serpent here is actually right. The Bible says that because sin came into this world, death by sin. That's what Scripture tells us, my friends. Uh, ultimately, when you look back to that, I know that may seem like a pat answer, and I don't mean it to, but folks, when you do think about evil, you have to go right back to that point. Why do people do bad things? Because of that flesh nature that has control uh, over them. Hey, listen, we're all born into this world, apart from God, in need of His grace. And that grace came in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. But can I tell you this? That on our worst day, if we gave into that old fleshly nature that should be dead to us, we can do some of the worst things. We as Christians, right? For those who are lost, for those who are following false religions, don't think about anything else. It's just following what their flesh has told them. 
and is dictated to them, if you will. Now, I'm not making excuses, my friend. I want you to know something. Those 19 hijackers and the people who planned that were evil individuals who were giving in to the very base, base, the most sinful, the worst sinful intentions that a person could give in to. To say, I'm going to take the life of someone who doesn't even know that it's coming. Someone I have nothing to do with. That's evil. I think we all agree with that. So some might ask, okay, why doesn't God do something about it? You wouldn't be alone in thinking that if you ever have. And I'll be honest with you, there have been times I've thought, Lord, why don't you step in? And I'm, I'm saying that carefully because I am no one to, to ever question God and how He does something and why He doesn't do something right when I think He should. The psalmist, though, thought the same thing. Look at what happens here. In Psalm chapter 73, we'll have it on the screen, but if you'd like to look it up too in your Bible, Psalm 73, 3-8. Let's start in verse 3 if you could. Yeah. Psalm 73, verse 3, For I was envious at the foolish, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in any trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. You know what he's saying? I, I, I was envious. I was upset because you look at these people and they, they're living their life the way they want to and they, they're, they're doing all kinds of evil, wrong things, sinful things. He said it doesn't seem like they're tripping over anything. It doesn't seem like they're having a problem doing it. Uh, things are going well for them. And he goes on to say, therefore pride covers them. He says, about as a chain, violence covers, covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. In other words, they're well fed. They have, uh, they have more than their heart could ever wish. They're corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. We're not the only one to ever wonder that. Let's jump down a few verses. I think it's the verse uh, 16, I think. Uh, verse 16 through 19. Notice what the psalmist now says. When I thought to know this, when I pondered it, right, when I really, this was bothering me, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terror. Do you know what the psalmist came to realize? That God will ultimately have the last word. But it'll be on his timetable, not on mine. We wonder why God is, why God doesn't do something right away at times. Now we know in the situation that I referenced 9-11, when those men left out into eternity, those hijackers, they immediately entered into a, into a place called hell. A priceless eternity. Right? That's the truth of any person that leaves this world without Jesus Christ, by the way. Not just the hijackers. Sadly. I believe the reason why God seems to take so long on exacting judgment. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter that He is not willing that any should perish. That all come for repentance. He is giving them their last chance. Their last call. Allowing them that opportunity to give their life to Christ. To say, Pastor with the evil and the sin that goes on. God would do that. Hey, friend, He saved me. He saved all of us. And I'm going to tell you, my sin deserves hell just like anybody else. Okay? Um, but on the other side of that coin, it isn't to say that God will not judge because He will. Somebody said it like this. You may juggle human laws. You may fool with human courts. But there is a divine judgment to come, and from that there is no appeal, there is no hiding. One day they will answer. 9 11 still reminds us of this harsh reality of the world we live in. 9 11, though, also reminds us, and thank God for this, of the value of heroism and sacrifice. John 15, 12 through 13, I've shared this passage numerous occasions, usually around the world today. Think about that thing, about what our soldiers have done for us. Jesus, in John 15, verse 12, you'll notice what he says here. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, he said. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Think about this. That's a God-based style of love, and that is sacrificial love. That's what it means. 
That's what he's speaking of. That's what he's referencing. Love that shows something. Love that means something. Love that is proof. He goes on and saying, uh, he, he gives us the second, or excuse me, the great commandment. The second half of the great commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But then he goes on and tells us, he further explains it by sharing with us that there is no greater proof of this than a person's willingness to lay down their life for the life of someone else. Powerful thing. It's reminiscent of what we saw on 9-11. For instance, who hasn't heard of the heroic acts of the passengers aboard flight, United Flight 93? One of those passengers was a man by the name of an individual you probably recognize, Todd Beamer, not because you maybe ever met him, sure you didn't, but you've heard of him since. In a conversation with the telephone operator, Todd said that the plane had been hijacked, that the passengers were discussing ways to overpower the hijacker, he then ended his conversation by asking the operator to pray with him. The last words the operator heard him say were this. Are you guys ready for a tour? Last words he never heard. The heroic sacrificial action by those passengers to bring down the plane no doubt saved many lives. As the hijackers were denied their ultimate target, some have surmised that that target could have been the White House. It could have been the President. We'll never know. But because of those men and because of those women on that plane who were willing to sacrifice themselves, they kept something bad from happening. Let's talk also about the first responders who ran into the buildings when everyone else was running out. These people did so not knowing whether they would make it home with their families at night. I come here in the morning and I know most likely I'm going to go home, Lord willing, go to be with my family. They knew this was bad. In fact, let me give you some perspective to that. 343 New York firemen, 37 Port Authority police officers, 15 EMT workers lost their lives on September 11th trying to save the lives of other people. It reminds us of the value of heroism, sacrifice. See, it shouldn't only really cause us to be grateful, and by the way, it should. The Bible says give honor to honor and we give you honor is due. Make sure that you pray for those sweet folks that have served and are serving even now. Not just in the military, but military, yes, also first responders. Praise God for them, amen? amen. It breaks my heart to see a country turn on its on, on a dime, if you will, uh, against police officers. People that we ought to honestly respect and appreciate and pray for. But it also reminds us as Christians that that sacrificial type of love is the kind of lifestyle and the way we ought to live every day of our life. It doesn't mean that, that every day of our life is going to call for that type of sacrifice, but it means that we love one another with that type of love. That's willing to show forth, that is willing to give, that is willing to be that agape style of love. It's a perfect example of it, my friends, and it reminds us that that's what I am called unto. That's what you are called unto as well. Theologian Augustine once said, or asked, was asked this, what does real love look like? Hmm. A lot of different definitions of love, isn't it? He responded by saying it has hands and it helps others. Feet to hasten to the poor and to the need. Eyes to see misery and want. Ears to hear the sighs of the sorrow of men. That is what love looks like. Sacrificial. 9-11 also reminds us I want you to catch this plan, if you will. It also reminds us that nothing in this world can offer full security except God. Nothing in this world can ever offer full security except God. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 20, verses 5 through 7. Psalm 20, verse 5 through 7. When those massive towers fell, I don't know how you felt. I, I looked at something that I had taken for granted most of my life growing up, seeing on the news, seeing the movies. Even now when I go back and watch an old movie and I see uh, those towers in the background, it just kind of gets to my heart, you know. My sister was there a year prior to 9-11 happening. I think it was about a year, six months to a year. And she took a picture in front of the Trade Center. And all you can see in the picture is her standing there in the Trade Center. You can't see the sky. You can't see anything around it because they're massive. Just huge. Right? And you'll remember too, if you're like me, I was a young, pretty young, younger guy then. <laughs> um, kids were small, in fact, Grace was just a baby. 
Um, I remember thinking, because in my lifetime, we had had attacks, there had been the Oklahoma City bombing, they had bombed the, the Trade Center earlier on, right? But there had never been an attack in that manner that woke us all up to say this. I had thought, up until that point, nobody could ever touch us inside the border of the United States of America. I'm sure it was the same feeling that people had during uh, World War or prior to World War II when Pearl Harbor was in. We're okay, we're safe, we're secure, government's taking care of it. Mm -hmm. Right? I just never thought that. But folks, how often do we think that? Not just about tragedies like 9-11, but life in general, that everything is secure because it's got money in the bank. Right? Everything's fine because the car is working today. <laughs> Look at what he says, Psalm 20, verse 5. We will rejoice in thy salvation in the name of our God. We will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petition. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear from his holy heaven with saving strength of his right hand. That's this point. Some trust in chariots, some horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. He said, you know what? You can trust in governments. You can trust in aircraft. You can trust in militaries. You can trust in tanks and guns and all those things. You can do that. But I'm going to tell you where I'm going to put my trust. That's in a name that will not fall. That's in a name that nobody can attack. I mean, they can attack it, but it's not going to do it really well. It's in the name of the Lord our God. He is our ultimate security. Amen? Yeah. He's the one we look to. He's the one we find hope and strength from because he alone is secure. Why? Because he's a constant. You know, the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Our God is constant. Think about it for a second. He's constantly holy. He's constantly just. He's constantly righteous. He's constantly loving. He constantly cares for us. He's the constant that we can wrap our arms around. I want to tell you, when I set through all that uh, in 9-11, it went through all of that, that in 2001. Even as a Christian, I'm sitting there going, what do you think? What do you say? We had a, a service, a quick prayer service that evening in our church in Donovan, and we came together, and I, I just, I, I was lost for words. I don't, for a Baptist pastor, you know that's a lot. I'm <laughs> not knowing what to say. You're gutted. And I'll never forget I preach out of Psalm 46. And we'll look for that later. But it's a reminder. Our God has to be our security. Our God has to be our trust. Because the things of this world so quickly and so easily can slip away from us. The truth is, and I hate saying this, but nobody in this country can promise you that we won't have to endure another 9-11. I hope that never happens again. My goodness, I pray against it. But speaking from human means, we can promise it. We can't promise something worse or less than it happened. We just can't. But I can tell you this. My God reigns on high. Yeah. He hasn't left this throne. He is still in control. Amen? Amen? And that is who we place our trust in. Deep inside the Arabian desert, small fortress that stands on the edge of the desert, there's a place that Thomas Lawrence. How many know that name? Couldn't reckon that you'd know it like that. Maybe you would know Lawrence of Arabia, right? He used to seek shelter there. Though it wasn't a beautiful place, it was a great place because of its security. It was loaded with food and supplies and had plenty of water. When under attack, often by superior forces, Lawrence would retreat to the fort and be able to defend himself and rely upon the supplies of the fort. His enemies would run out of supplies and the elements would start taking their toll on the uh, on them. And finally, the enemy would have to retreat and they couldn't stay any longer. What happened at that fort is that the strength of the fort became the strength of those who occupied it. But for that fort to be able to provide protection for Lawrence, what did he have to do? He had to go in to that fort. My friends, I'm telling you this. We have to be found in Jesus Christ to know this security. We have to give our life in Him. And no matter what goes on around us, the storms rage around us, in Christ is my peace. In Christ is my security. Look at one more passage. We'll read it for you in Psalm 61, 1 through 3. Psalm 61, 1 through 3. Listen to the heart cry of this psalmist. He said, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. You ever felt like that? 
not just at 9-11, but other times in life. From the end of the earth will I cry unto you, Lord. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me, I love this part, to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter to me, is what he says, in a strong tower. From who? The enemy. Who is? You are, God. You are. 9 11 reminds us that while nothing on this earth can offer full security, God can. 9 11 still reminds us that tomorrow is promised to no one. I mentioned this earlier. It just as a turn to Bible, James 4 13. You know, we're jumping around a lot here today. Forgive me, but thank you for your patience. James chapter 4. In verse 13 through 14. James says, Go to now, verse 13, you that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, continue there a year, buy, sell, get gain. Whereas you know not what it shall be on the morrow. For what is your life that is even a vapor that appeareth for just a little time and then vanishes away? You know what James is actually saying is is that we really make a, a, a huge error when we fail to to live life by the will of God. All right, we all have our, and we all do it, I do it. And by that I mean this, that we have our plans for tomorrow. How many got plans for tomorrow? Or, yeah. <laughs> I just saw the enthusiasm run out of the room there. Just say, <laughs> yay, work. Anyway, we have our plans, right? But who's to say those plans are going to come to fruition? Who's to say that? God doesn't have other plans. Right? And so the point being is that we ought to live our life according to the will of God. We ought to beseech the Lord and to be your will. This is what I'd like. Line my life up to your will. But he ends that little, that little uh, those few verses there by reminding us that truly life passes so quickly. It's here one minute, it's gone the next. It's like a vapor of smoke. You watch it, it just dissipates. 20 years, folks. I'm telling you, that seems like it was yesterday. But I think back at all the water that's been under the bridge, all the life and living that I have done personally, and I think, how can that be possible? Anybody else feel like that? How is that even possible? I think that about my whole life, really, up until this point. Right? You guys that uh, are waiting to get your driver's license, once you do, once you graduate, move out of the house, that's when it really starts ramping up. I don't know why it just does. It starts moving quickly. It's long. Here's my point, though, folks. It's an invalid point. 9 11 reminds us to love our families. To love those who are important. We're to love everybody, the Bible says. But to show that love, to wrap our arms around uh, our, our, our family members and those that God has placed within our life. You, you can't tell me that if those people didn't know that that was the life, last day that they were going to live, that they wouldn't reach out and grab their kids and hug them a little tighter. They said that many of the cell phone calls that came from the aircraft, that came from the towers, ended. I love you. Don't forget I love you. And that gets them. What it reminds me. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised five minutes from now, folks. Do you know that? We're just not. They say, wow, that's a real upper, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but listen. That's truth. That's reality. Now, I can either take that and ignore it, or I can take that and say, you know what? Lord, help me to apply my heart unto wisdom, because I am only given a certain amount of time on this earth. I don't know how long that is. God, I only have so much time, so help me to spend it wisely. Help me to pour into the lives of others. Help me to serve you, ultimately, first and foremost, right? Let me tell you something. If you're here today, you don't know Christ is your Savior. My friend, this one point right here ought to resonate. I can't promise you that any of us will be here tomorrow. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to say tomorrow is promised to no one. The Bible says it appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. And I'll tell you what makes the difference in that judgment. Do I know Christ? I'm not. And by that I mean not about him. I'm not saying do I know about him. I'm saying do I know him personally. Have I ever surrendered my life to him? Asking him to come into my life to save me. Give me of my sins. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Have you ever done that? Christian, can we live our life kingdom focused? 
instead of self-focus. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we were talking about maturity. Right? Understanding that tomorrow's promise to no one ought to spur us on not to grow our own personal kingdom, but to grow the kingdom of God. To do the Lord's work. Amen? He said, well, pastor, are you saying I need to uh, uh, quit my job tomorrow and, and go be a missionary? If God's calling you to do that, then yes, you better do that, okay? But that's not exactly what I'm saying. What I am telling you is that you be a missionary right where you're at. You fulfill the Lord's will right where you're at. The calling He has placed on you at that moment and at that time, be faithful to God. Recognize that you're not working for a man, you're working for God. Amen? Amen. Recognizing that you know what? Tomorrow's promise to none of us. It, it just isn't. Paul said today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. In an article, 2002 edition of Focus on the Family magazine, it detailed the actions of Al Bronco. Al Bronco, I probably never heard that name before, and I hadn't either until I come across this. It was a man who lived and knew and recognized that I won't have to know. Al Bronco worked on the 105th floor of the Tower One of the Trade Center. When he realized that they were trapped in that building and would be unable to escape, Al shared the gospel with 50 of his co-workers and led them in prayer. Some of those same individuals had been people that in the past mocked him for his faith. Led them to Christ. Why? Because he recognized it. I don't have to know. I need to be about God's business right now. And then finally, 9-11 still reminds us of God's overwhelming love and presence. Are you serious, Pastor? Yeah. I'm so thankful to know that it's in the hard times, it's in the difficult times, that my God's love and His presence are felt more than at any other time. I'm not saying they can't be felt at other times. I'm saying that it shines brighter than the difficulties like what we went through. Psalm 46, 1 through 3, if you would. Psalm 46, 1 through 3. The psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof sea. Notice he said God is a very present help. He's not distant. He's not absent. He's present. It's right here. Jump down a few verses to verse 10. God says, Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. And I'm Jacob. I love this word. Is our refuge. So, my friends, no matter what the trial may be, no matter what the difficulty may be, our God is as faithful today as He's ever been. Yeah. And that love and His presence shine brighter. And those times are difficult. We see it in the acts of love that were displayed on 9 11. We see it in the acts that were displayed afterwards. And I remind you, certainly 9 11 has come and gone, but we face difficulties all the time in our life as human beings. And I want you to know something that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Romans 8 35 to 39 says, Not tribulation, not distress, not peril, not nakedness, not sword, not any kind of demon. Nothing can separate us. From the love of Christ. That is His promise to us. That means this, that no matter how I feel at that given moment in time, no matter how I feel, God's love is a constant. God's love is constant, my friends, because my faith isn't based on just my feelings and my emotions. It's based on the truth of God's Word. And God's Word is true regardless of what season it is in my life. How about for you? Amen? I'll share this story and we're finished. It's the words that were written in a book uh, by Lisa Beamer, Todd's daughter. She reflects back on the loss of her dad in this book. This is what she said. Slowly I began to understand that the plans God has for us don't just include good things, but the whole array of human events. The prospering that he talks about in the book of Jeremiah is often the outcome of a bad event. I remember my mom saying that many people look for miracles, things that in their human minds they can fix a difficult situation. Many miracles, however, are not a change to the normal course of human events. They're found in God's ability and desire to sustain and nurture people through even the worst 
of situations. Somewhere along the way, I stopped demanding that God fix the problems in my life and started to be thankful for His presence as I do. That is the daughter of someone who had to say goodbye to her dad. And I don't know. I don't know about you. That speaks to me. God's love is a constant. His presence is a constant. No matter what I'm going through. If we stand with our heads down and our eyes closed, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. We're going to take some time to pray during this invitation. And then afterward, I'm going to ask a couple of our men to pray for some specific things. But would you come with me right now to pray together as a church family for those who are hurting today and this weekend because 20 years has come, all this stuff has been brought back up to the surface, we understand, and, and necessarily so it needed to be so. But the hurt is just as real today as it was 20 years ago, so would you pray for them? Pray for those families that lost loved ones in the war that followed afterwards. A lot of those folks even here recently. Would you do that? Would you pray for our country? Because 9-11 also reminds us that our country desperately needs God. It needs to turn back to God. I want to tell you something, friend. The answer isn't found in waiting for Congress or the government or the White House to get it straight. The answer is found with every believer in this room today and around this world and in this country, turning their hearts to the Lord, saying, God, light me a fire. Set my heart on fire for you. Help me to care more about your kingdom than I do my own selfish desires. Help me to find revival and let that spread to others. Would you pray for that too? Please. Would you pray that God use us in his kingdom to make a difference in this country? Would you do that right now? Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. Thank you for the, every soul that's here this morning do that you would have done. Remind us, God, that we're not promised tomorrow. There may be some in here today that need to give their life to Jesus, God. If that's the case, I pray that you would remove all obstacles or take away all pride or clear the road and call them. Father, please, give your Holy Spirit. Help them to see that he that comes to Jesus will kill no one's cast. Father, help us wrap our arms around the things that are precious to you and the things that are precious to us. That are right. Take advantage of the time you've given us. Lord, please, we pray for our country. We pray for the hurting in our nation today and this weekend that you would comfort them. We pray for the moms, the dads, the spouses, the children who have lost their family members. The war that followed 9 11. God, we pray and lift up with them up to you that great grace and mercy you've given to them. We pray for our leaders of our country right now. God, they need you. Help them to lead with righteousness, with wisdom. Help them to repent of sin. Help us as a nation to repent of our sin. Please work in, this part, in our hearts today. To Jesus' name we ask.